Now that Battlefront 2 is finally out in the wild and I have my own copy to play from the comfort of my own home, I wanted to make a review and tell you what I think about it and whether or not you should buy it. Let's get started. First and foremost, we have to begin with a few disclosures for legal purposes, and then we'll move on to some of the controversy surrounding the game amidst my actual review. All gameplay footage here is my own. I did recorded this on my own personal copy of the game from my own home. None of this is taken from an event or anything like that. This is all my own footage. Now, I do need to note that I did not purchase this game myself. I want to make that a full disclosure. I did not purchase this game myself. I was given this for free by Electronic Arts. No money at all exchanged hands in order for me to earn this copy of this game. So that needs to be addressed. But with that out of the way, it's no secret that there's a potential uh, conflict of interest between myself and Electronic Arts and DICE in making this overview. So I can't deny that, but I'm going to do my best to be impartial and give the most fair take of the game and the most honest feedback that I possibly can. So this review is going to follow a pretty atypical format, but that's honestly pretty standard for my channel anyways. I always do stuff my own way, so hopefully that's all right for you guys. Now, is Battlefront worth buying? Today, I'm going to be answering that, and my answer is going to vary distinctly based upon a lot of key factors that define you as a gamer. At its surface, Star Wars Battlefront 2 is nothing short of beautiful. The graphics are pristine, and everything in the game looks like it was pulled straight off the silver screen. Seriously, the aesthetics are pretty flawless, and this is due in large part to every game asset receiving George Lucas approval before uh, actually being put into the full game. Now, take this and add in those crispy, authentic sound effects alongside the Star Wars music backing the game up, and you've got a game that genuinely feels like you're playing the movies. It's really, really fantastic, and I'm not kidding when I say this. I'm not embellishing, and I'm not being paid to say it. The game is a 10 out of 10 in the aesthetics front. It's like nothing that I've ever played in my life. It, nothing even comes close to what this game accomplishes. Now, if you're a fan of Star Wars and you want one of the greatest Star Wars video games that have ever been made, at least from an, an immersion standpoint, shut down this review right now because this is the game for you. Just go and buy it. It's worth it if for just for that alone. But if that's not your only reason for buying games, then watch on. Now, not everyone buys games for their aesthetics. And at the end of the day, you have to actually, well, play your games. So what does it feel like to play this game? Long story short, it's mostly good. Gunplay in the first game was pretty alright as it was, but in the sequel, DICE has really gone to the next level and making this truly special. Every blaster fires projectiles, meaning that you're always leading your shots at medium or long range. Hitboxes are pretty generous, but again, this is intended to be a pretty casual game, so that's a good thing. Blasters feel like you'd think that they would feel from watching the movies. They've really nailed the aesthetic yet again. They feel good, they look good, they are good. They did a perfect job on the blaster front and on the infantry front in general. Infantry soldiers move the way you would expect, and everyone has access to a combat role ability, which honestly kind of weirdens, weirdens? Kind of makes the infantry gameplay weird to me, in a way. It's kind of a stupid gaming mechanic that kills my immersion and really does not feel like it has a place in a game like this, but I recognize that we are, in fact, playing a video game and characters are inherently going to have to do things that, well, resemble this. It's just something that has to be there, something that has to happen. And not this particular mechanic, but mechanics like this, which kind of take you out of the game and seem really gamist in nature. They have to be there in some capacity to make a video game good. So, so it's not something that you should base your purchasing decision off of, per se, but it's something to note and something that irritates me a little bit when actually playing the game. Things just feel kind of awkward in that regard. Now, heroes across the board feel pretty nice. A lot of the Jedi and Sith are a little bit slower than you might expect them to be, but once you get to playing them, you 
quickly understand why they're a little bit slower. It's purely a balanced thing, and honestly, the game is better for it. This is a positive aspect of the game, and how gamist practices can actually improve a game, even if it causes a sort of uh, deviation from the source material. So, they did a good job there. After a little bit of growing pains, realizing that Ray is just not that fast, or Luke is just not that fast, things turned out pretty okay. Now, vehicles. Vehicles feel absolutely fantastic, and much to my surprise, Starfighters in particular are my favorite class to play as in in the game. I mean, I just, I, I love flying around in this game for whatever reason. It really grabs me. The flight model is simple to understand, and once you get used to it, you can command your ship through really tight spaces in a pinch with startling accuracy. Again, the aesthetics here are... Top notch. The feeling of shaking a TIE fighter that's on my tail by deftly swerving obstacles is utterly unmatched by any other game on the market, save perhaps for like something like Star Citizen, Ace Combat, Elite Dangerous, things like that. For somebody who's not a geek for flying games though, Battlefront 2 is a real treat and is approachable for everyone. Now, as for the ground vehicles, things are a lot more hit or miss. Many are awkward to pilot and use effectively, and have a horrible habit of changing your aim sensitivity as a mouse player. I can understand the reasoning behind it. The developers want to instill a sense of weight or mass behind particular vehicles or turrets or the like, so they want them to move much more slowly and have that molasses feel to them. But in my opinion, this is a cardinal sin that should never ever be committed by any developer and honestly makes me never want to set foot inside of a ground vehicle or turret if I know that it's one that changes my aim sensitivity. Now, this exact same complaint extends to the Heavy Infantry's Sentry Turret ability. I literally, literally, never want to press that Sentry Turret button because as soon as I do, I know my sensitivity is dropping down to nothing. Now, I'm a player that uses 15 inches per 360, so that means that if I take my mouse, I have to move it 15 inches from left to right or right to left to do a 360 in the horizontal direction. That is a very universal method of calculating sensitivity and applying it to different games on different engines, you know, across different mice and DPI values, sensitivity modifiers, whatever. Like, it always can come down to an inches or centimeters per 360 calculation. I'm at 15 inches. That's pretty slow. And if you take that and you combine it with... A 50% or 25% modifier on top of my already low uh, sensitivity, I can't freaking use vehicles. Like, I cannot drive a tank. I can't do it. I cannot turn a turret. I just can't. I, it's absolutely insane. I would need to set up a DPI switcher, which honestly, I refuse to do in a, a modern video game in the year 2017. Coming up on 2018 very soon here. Uh, I should not ever have to set a DPI switcher in order to use everything in a game with the sensitivity I want to use it at. Just straight up. It should not be a thing I have to do. Every piece of equipment, every vehicle, every car, every bike, every tank, every turret, they should have the exact same sensitivity response as my infantry soldier has, or I should have an option to make them the same if they're not that way inherently. I understand the, feel, the need for aesthetics and feelies and all that stuff, but... From a gameplay standpoint, it's really, really bad. So, anyways, to get off that little train, to summarize so far, the game is honestly pretty fantastic. The aesthetics and sound are as close to as perfect as I've seen in a video game, as I've stated before, and the way the engine handles all the different modes of play is smooth and nice to the touch, if, if you will. This is, of course, with the exception of every selection in the game that alters your base sensitivity, which is a small dumpster fire in a vast galaxy full of water. So what I'm trying to say there is it's not a huge deal. It's really annoying to someone like me, but for the vast majority of people out there, it's not that big of a problem. So again, it, for most people, maybe not something worth basing your game purchase decisions off of, but it's something to be aware of and something to play around if you are a sweaty tryhard like me. If you're still with me so far, and nice aesthetics and core gameplay are all that you're really after, then look no further. Star Wars Battlefront 2 is a great game with just a small, a few small flaws, which honestly is 
pretty typical. It's pretty par for the course at this point. Look no further. Buy this game. You will like it. You'll enjoy it. You'll have fun with it. You'll be happy that you got it. And you're going to enjoy your time. Just go get it. But if you're still not quite convinced or you want to see the even deeper levels uh, for even more serious FPS fans or more serious shooter fans, I should say, let's dig a little deeper. Now, you're going to notice that I've split everything that we talked about gameplay-wise into three categories. Infantry, heroes, and vehicles. There's a reason for this, and that is star cards. So... It's finally time to open that can of worms, so let's just go and dive headfirst into it. These star cards, and by extension, loot crates, are the source of the internet's wrath over the last couple of days, and honestly, rightfully so. This is a game review though, so I'm going to keep this segment on topic with how the game itself actually plays. Straight up, in my experience, infantry star cards are mostly in line and not too crazy. There's a few must-haves, such as buffs for your thermal detonator and shotgun on assault, or the bubble shield for the officer. In most situations, these are non-negotiable, and you must spend crafting materials to get them ASAP if you don't get lucky on your loot crates and you want to play these classes at the highest possible level. The fact that you can play these cards and you can buy these cards outright for a relatively cheap price is good in and of itself, but unfortunately we face a much bigger problem. Each class that you play has two separate levels, a class level and a star card level. And these are totally separate from one another and they mean different things. So let's say for example, I'm playing the officer, one of my favorite classes. If I'm playing that class for 10 hours, I could raise my class level to some number above one. Let's just call it six. Why not? It's a number that I made up. I have no idea how fast the XP gain is, but let's just say after 10 hours, I go from level one to level six. Okay. Doesn't really mean anything for my actual class. I could have a level 6 officer, doesn't make me better, doesn't make me faster, doesn't make me stronger. It's just a level, okay? Fine, whatever. It's there. Not really anything to be upset or happy about. It just exists. But what really matters in a much bigger way is your star card level. Your star card level is determined essentially by the number and quality of the star cards that you own for a particular class. So let's say after my 10 hours of play, I could be a sixth level officer, right? I could be a level six officer, but I may have gotten no luck on my loot crates so far. Thus, my star card level is one. I have, or zero even, I have no star cards for this class, none. My star card level is zero. No amount of gameplay is going to improve my star card level. Why is this important? Well. When you buy star cards, or when you get star cards out of crates, that star card level increases. When you get to level 5, star card level 5, I mean, you unlock a second star card slot. When you reach level 10, star card level 10, you'll get a third star card slot. So, there is incentive in buying crates. There is incentive in crafting wide. And what I mean by that is crafting multiple separate cards for one class whether or not you plan on using them like if a class has 10 cards you can buy all 10 of them at their level one level for 40 uh, scrap each so 400 scrap and it's essentially the cost that you must pay in order to play your class at the level it was intended to be played and that's just the minimum right that's just to get to the first step of that which is to have all three of your your star card slots open now, if you want to get to better and better star cards in each of those slots, now you have to spend all your scrap 80, then like 160, and like 400, I think, for every individual step of going from level 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 with each individual star card. So you you can't go tall from the beginning. And the reason you can't go tall, and, and what I mean by going tall is upgrading one or two cards really high, really fast, is that your character level, your class level, it dictates how high you can upgrade your star cards. So, right off the bat, uh, I think you can upgrade to level two star cards right off the bat, even at level zero for your um, for your class. It might be level one, but I, I want to say it's level two. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you're 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 
actual class level limits the height at which you can build up each individual star card, which in a lot of ways is a good thing because it means you cannot pay to win your way to victory by putting, you know, three purple star cards, which is the max level star card on your class and have that right from the get go. You have to work and play your ca your, your class to earn the right to equip those higher level cards. Okay, fine, whatever. But the fact still remains that you have to waste scrap on a bunch of cards you don't want in order to go wide enough to equip three cards simultaneously, or you have to not buy those cards, save your scrap, and pray to Lord Gaben that you're able to, to get all of these uh, loot crates to give you the star cards you need to increase your star card level for the class you actually want to play. So it, it, it is this really, really restrictive sort of way to, to, to basically make, make it so you have to grind your class, you have to grind a particular character for inordinate amounts of time in order to get the things that you want. And th this doesn't even begin to mention uh, all of the different heroes in the game. This is just talking purely about the different base infantry classes. What happens when you have to play Luke, or you have to play Darth Vader, or you have to play Kylo Ren for dozens if not hundreds of hours to get them to a high enough class level as well as star card level to equip everything that you need it's an absurd level of grind an absurd level of work to get to the level that you want to be in order to properly min max your character and as a min maxer as a, as a sweaty tryhard myself that's too much work. It's too much effort. It's not even close to being an amount that I want to participate in. So no matter how good the game is, no matter how good the mechanics are, no matter how, how immersive it is, no matter how fucking amazing of a job that everyone making this game has done, the star card system completely destroys the game. At a competitive level. It completely ruins it from a min-maxer's level. Even if those star cards don't actually make any difference in the way the game plays, human psychology dictates that if you see some guy at the top of the leaderboard with three purple star cards, you're going to blame it on the star cards most of the time. Very few times you're going to say, wow, that guy's just really good. He could have no star cards and still kick my butt. Whether or not that's true... You're still going to have that sneaking suspicion, that 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 itch in the back of your brain, like, oh, that guy's got the purple cards. And you can't have those too because you haven't played as much or you haven't spent as much money on the game. Now, I admit, yes, at the time of recording, microtransactions are not in the game. They were in the game a couple of days ago, and it sounds like they're going to be coming back very soon. As of right now, they're not there though. But just keep this in mind. Whenever you may watch this review, just do your research. Make sure you know what the microtransaction landscape looks like and make sure that you're willing to operate uh, either with or against all of these star cards and make sure that you understand how they work, how they're acquired, because it may change after this video is made, but it has a drastic effect on your, your, your psychological perception of the game and it may have a big effect on your ability to have fun in the game. I know for me personally, Star cards really kill it for me, especially because my favorite two modes are Starfighter Assault and Heroes vs. Villains. And which two modes have the biggest impact of star cards? Starfighter Assault and Hero vs. Villains. Infantry star cards don't matter so much, but star car uh, Starfighter star cards are friggin' insane. They're necessary. You need them. You have one star card that makes it take, like, two times as long for a proton or tor torpedo to lock on. You have another card that, that makes your turning radius uh, a lot tighter, so it's a lot easier for you to escape targets or to chase targets down, and those stupid loop-de-loop -loop battles that people do constantly. Frankly, heroes are not also excluded from this. Heroes have some of the same problems some of them need particular star cards to make their abilities work the way they want. Darth Vader with pure high level star cards gives him like eight quadrillion health points and health regeneration upon kills and all this and that. And some of these classes just become absolutely bonkers with these high level star cards stacked and stacked and stacked. And they are a necessity to play these classes the way that you want to play them. Some of these classes, some of these starfighters are hot garbage until you get all the cards that you need to make them super duper high level and just the best possible thing you could use. And it's problematic, it's unfun, it's it's unfriendly to, to players, and it really kills the game for me. So my final verdict is 
if you're interested in a Star Wars game for just good core gameplay alongside of great graphics and sound and immersion and all that good stuff, Battlefront 2 is a no-brainer purchase. You should buy it and play it. You will love it. You're going to have a fantastic experience. If you're buying Battlefront 2 for the multiplayer to play it for dozens or hundreds of hours, I urge you to use caution and just just be forewarned at what you're getting yourself into. It is a big, big, big grind, and you're going to get upset at people who have star cards that you don't have. And this is a, uh, a feeling that I have not really had playing any other game ever. In, in most other competitive shooter games, things have been much more level across the board. I've never really dealt with these performance-enhancing cards uh, or similar systems in other first-person shooting games. So my, my, my final review is that the game is good. The base game is really, really good, but the star cards are dumb. They really break stuff, and I wish they weren't there. So I hope this has been helpful to you guys. I hope that it's been educational, and I hope that it has helped you make an informed decision about buying this game. The developers at DICE have done a fantastic job nine times out of ten with this game. A lot of parts are really, really good. The story was great fun. Uh, it was actually a really, really nice story, actually. Um, and it gave you a lot of insight into what's happened between episodes, I think, six and seven. And uh, lets you in on a little bit of lore that uh, you might not otherwise know. And uh, was worth it for that much alone. But, again, my, uh, my opinions are a little skewed because I played it both before release and for freeze. So, you know, there's that whole thing too. Would I spend $60 right now for the campaign that I played a couple of weeks ago before the game came out? I don't know. Not sure. I'd pay 40 I'd pay 40 bucks. Would I pay 60 I don't know. I'm not sure that I'm that big of a Star Wars fan. And I think I'm a decently big Star Wars fan, so I don't know. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something new. Hope this helped you out. If you have any questions, please leave me a question down below. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.